Talking about getting lazy, but why did you get out of venture capital? Because I'm a lazy bug. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, um, you know the answer to it, right? I, uh, we as Wellington decided four and a half years ago to no longer invest in this type of stuff. And uh, it took me four and a half years to realize that I'm not an internet investor, I guess. And so I'm back in uh, your space, but as an angel, uh, active board member and stuff like that. I'm still doing stuff for Wellington because I guess after 15 years, you don't leave in a day, but um, yeah. It's, uh, Would you like to join a new clean tech fund in the future? I'm not sure. Actually, I'm kind of like I discovered I have a wife and three children, which my, <laughs> my wife claims they're mine. So, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, I'm kind of like having fun the, the way I'm doing right now. So maybe, but I'm not necessarily convinced that I'll do that, actually. I've done 17 years of fund life, and uh, it's, uh, it's kind of cool to do the, the stuff I'm doing now. Cool. Okay, the other gentleman you already know, and the little secret is uh, Philip. He used to work for Son Battery. Wow! Oh. <laughs> and now you are you competing. Know. <laughs> <laughs> you never you did, noticed. Right? <laughs> did you actually know when you joined uh, Tesla that one day you would be competing with a Son Battery? If you would have vis visited Tesla factory in Fremont in 2013, you would have seen the stationary storage at the door already exactly. so um, this is uh, it, I think I think it was obvious for anybody who ever visited Tesla um, that there would be some kind of uh, storage history I uh, know future history also but um, but that was not my primary purpose Christoph uh, we want to talk about the US market what is your US strategy can you briefly summarize it how do you enter the US market and why do you do it Okay, um, first of all, we do it because we consider the US market to be um, a very, very attractive market. Um, so far, we have been selling only um, into Europe, um, whereof Germany is actually representing roughly 90% of our revenues. This has a lot to do with market maturity. Germany is simply leading um, uh, the Energiewende, and um, especially for um, a highly innovative product. Um, and in the beginning, um, when the costs and the prices are still high, Germany is, of course, the perfect playground for startups like, like we are. Um, but we see in the US also a very high potential market. So we already decided um, a little bit more than two years ago when we were a company with 25, 30 employees and uh, three and a half million revenues um, to go there. And it has really been a long process preparing everything because Obviously, you have to do two things. First of all, you have to prepare the market. And secondly, you have to prepare um, the product, right? And of course, yourself as an organization. And this, is, uh, this was the work of the last two years, actually. We are shortly before market entrance um, uh, in two months at the InterSolar show in uh, San Francisco. Uh, and uh, you are um, uh, planning to produce uh, your product locally with a contract manufacturing partner, right? Absolutely. Um, generally, we are following a, um, a contract manufacturing um, uh, supply chain strategy. Of course, we have um, uh, at our headquarters our own factory, but once we reach uh, the limit of, of capacity, which will be maybe in a year or so, um, uh, 20,000 systems a year, um, then we are going to work only with contract manufacturers in order to expand capacities. And we are currently choosing a contract manufacturer um, sitting in California, this is important to get the subsidy there, the S-chip, so it has to be assembled in California, not in Mexico, not somewhere else. And um, yeah, this is how we, we are planning that. Philip, do you think it's a good idea for Christoph to enter the US market? Absolutely. Yeah? Short and sweet. <laughs> you are not afraid of German competition over there? No, I think, uh, I think we all agree, at least Christoph and I agree, that the real competition is not the, the other good guy who's starting an, uh, a startup for storage, but the real competition is the huge energy market that is not penetrated yet by our services. So I think we should rather focus on joining forces <coughs> to, to uh, increase the market share for all of us. And this is the, 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 the real target and also the real challenge instead of uh, looking um, how to compete in between. Yeah, I think that's the, the key message for us. Absolutely. And I would like to add that 
everybody is talking about this fabulous storage market, yeah? But the market is not there. It's not falling from the sky. The market has to be created. And I know exactly what I'm talking about because we created this market in Germany, being really the pioneer starting January 2011. So if we can join forces in order to create this market, moving this market forward, it is a beneficial situation for the whole industry. Mm. So, yeah. Are you guys considering to, st to work together, actually? Like, uh, use their uh, building blocks and be a channel for them? Or would you use them as a channel? After? Not at the moment, because also uh, at Tesla, we want to understand uh, things in, 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 in the whole depth of it. So we want to have always our own product and the direct customer access, because if you make a market, if, if there is no market and you're making it, it makes sense to be in control of the whole strategy of implementation and to invest in your own market, in, in your own brand and in your own infrastructure. So this is, this is so it's, it's not, but I'm seeing it as the same struggle because we have a huge uh, PR uh, response now to Powerwall in Germany and all of Europe. Um, I even said uh, that it's a bit larger in Germany, at least, than it was for the Model S when it was introduced in 2013. So there's, there's really a hype, yeah? And yeah, and it's also a cool car, right? Car. Yeah, and uh, so, no, I think, I think for, the, for the moment, um, it, it's not an option, yeah. So if I'm nice to you, will you change it against a D or? If the, you're nice to me, and if you pull the f <laughs> pay the full price without a discount, okay. so the two of them, you mm. will change. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Okay. You own a Tesla, right? Yeah. Is but, it still working? But not the D. <laughs> not, not the, well, he now comes with a better one, right? It's only a year old and it's already obsolete, no? No, it's not obsolete. Not. No. <laughs> this, is, this is, you have all the fancy software updates, right? I mean, if you drive a BMW, you wouldn't have that. Are you, not, are you happy with your Tesla? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a great car. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's very funky. It's very no, funky. No, no, no. We have, we have, uh, where do you use it? In, uh, in Munich. In Munich. Yeah, oh, you, really? you don't get that far from Munich with the Tesla, yeah, right? But you should join us. <laughs> <laughs> no, Depends yeah, on. Yes. I, I made, how, often, made, how often did you supercharge it? Actually, I've never done it because they don't really have a supercharger close to Munich. Uh, there's one in Augsburg, I think, but I've never gone that direction. Are you, uh, I drove to uh, the Dolomites and then uh, I thought, hmm, it's getting a little bit tight. So I looked for the nearest supercharger and it was St. Anton. When was which, that? Uh, this was in March. Somebody's, somebody's putting down my volume or oh, now it's back up. Yeah, exactly. This was in March. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, in, in, if, if the, the next time, just go to teslamotors.com. We have uh, 37 superchargers in Germany. You can go. You can go go for free from from Munich to Amsterdam to Stockholm to Oslo to Côte d'Azur to Geneva to many many cities and more are coming. And to demonstrate this, we'll have a hundred Model S um, joining the Electric Mobility Forum here in Berlin um, on the 15th of uh, June to demonstrate that they come from all parts of Europe and for free and of course carbon neutral. Um, and I myself drove the P85D, <coughs> the one with the lots of power, from Munich to Frankfurt, and it was, was, really, it was really... Let's continue um, the nice uh, Tesla time. customer training after the panel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we only have 21 oh, minutes man. left, right? <laughs> <laughs> it took five minutes, right? <laughs> It's all about airtime, yeah? <laughs> yeah. But it really, uh, it, it really looks like uh, it's a complex product with all the supercharging service and, and that not all of your customers know exactly how, how powerful it is oh, already works, or not. Yeah. <laughs> Hug, um, you are entering the American market. Why do you do it and how do you do it? I am curious to learn. Well, why do we do it? Because it's a big market with a lot of customers. <laughs> so yeah. that's uh, most probably the first reason why we do it. Well, second, because in, in modeling and simulation, uh, it's, it's also an era where you've got uh, a lot of potential partners for the company. And we can learn a, a lot from them. And third, uh, because if we look at the future, uh, we believe that Cosmo will be financed not only by European investors, but also by, by American investors. So that th these are the three major reasons. So you are actually uh, looking for American co-investors. And Christoph, you also look for American co-investors, right? As a principle, yes, <laughs> but uh, not, not really, not really yet. Not now, because, but soon. No, because we had our, our B-series round in uh, November last year. Hmm. Um, uh, we have now three European VCs on board. And, um, well, my experience is that uh, it makes sense to, first of all, prove the pudding 
to show some traction in the States and then to talk to US investors, not before. So. But I want to ask you, you are going to and fro to the US and to Europe, and you have a couple of portfolio companies uh, that you brought to the US market. Most what are your key lessons on how to make business with them? Well, we, we kind of like made a, as, as Wellington, we made a, um, a ploy of it, right? It's, it's kind of what we promise our startups, like we'll help them to go to the US and, and to be successful. So I probably spent the last 10 years, eight weeks a year in, the, in California. And uh, I think the first observation is it's, uh, it's fucking hard. Um, and and it's, it's hard for European companies because um, I think in Europe, <laughs> Uh, Bad news, huh? Well, well, it's I, exciting I, too. Well, <laughs> very exciting. Now, well, it's it's one. It's hard because uh, Europeans are just notoriously bad at selling stuff, and in the U.S., if you want to be successful, you need to be very good at selling something. So there's a kind of like a skills mismatch. And then the second thing which we found out is that uh, when you then go to the U.S. and you hire a U.S. team it's almost harder to hire a really good US team than it is in Asia, because when you're in China and you come there and you try to interview these people, you know, after five minutes you realize, gee, these guys, they talk different, they look different, I don't understand it. So you very quickly realize like, okay, I cannot be the judge of what the best sales guy for the Chinese market is. So you get help and you get people to do it. Now you're a German uh, startup and you go to the US and you think, well, they look like me, they talk like me, and uh, so you think, I can judge this, so you actually make this judgment. So you see German startups hiring the best sales guy from a German perspective, which most of the time, actually, which all of the time, is not the best sales guy for the US market. So uh, that would be one of my biggest advices to any startup going to the US is they look like you, they talk like you, they are not like you, and so you, you better get some help in trying to get the right people on board. So that's, uh, that's probably the... How can you get American co-investors? I understand there is two types. One of them is allowed to invest in a European startup, and one only invests if um, the headquarter is American. What is your experience? And would you recommend these guys uh, to even shift the headquarter to yeah. the US? So the, my experience to, to, to tag on to what you said is that the ones uh, uh, that are allowed to invest in European companies are the ones that like that European company. And then suddenly they're allowed to invest in that European company. And if they're not allowed, that means they don't like the company typically. I think there's, uh, there's always ways to do it. Uh, some of the funds indeed um, uh, can only invest in the Delaware Inc. But you know, in the end of the day, that's quickly set up. And then there's even structures where you know, you just, so we, we've done that many times. Um, so I think um, there is just, um, the US guys, when they invest in a European startup, they typically like to have someone on the ground that they know, that they've worked with before. So I think if you're selecting your uh, European VCs, uh, it makes sense to take those that have actually done deals with uh, the US guys before, so that they, you know, they talk that language, they've got some experience, and uh, that, that's, I think, is one of the things that we, uh, have done quite a bit, and um, um, then you just need to have a, a good profile as a company. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that I think you you either get them in really early, and uh, Kleiner, Sequoia, um, at some point Venrock as well, but they stopped doing that. Uh, they got in really early, and we did a bunch of deals with these guys, um, with, with all of the three above. And um, then they also, when you get further with the company and you have significant revenues, you get a different group of people that are interested. When you're like in the middle, you know, you do your, I don't know, 5 million revenue, 10 million revenue. It's, it's a tough moment of your company to, uh, whereas of course from a company perspective, it's a natural moment. But then, you know, the valuation versus the risk, the Americans don't like it. That's just my experience. So you either get them early and or you get them later and you get different guys to come in. That's the way that we were doing it always. I don't know. It's just what we did. And it works sometimes. And your portfolio, is it, um, has it been successful in the US market? Was it always a good decision to go there? Um, so you I'm, said it was fucking hard. But yeah, <laughs> so, so, I think, so I, um, I think yes, uh, or not always, and yes. I think it's always a good idea to go there because of the reasons that were uh, articulated. And I think there's, there's one which I was missing, funnily. I think one of the main reasons why we take these companies to the US is because uh, we want to tap into the exit markets there. And, uh, and that's not just the IPO markets, but that's also the, uh, the, the potential 
partnerships which can evolve into trade sales. And, and if, if you are a known company in the US, it's just that's where your exit's going to be. And if you are more of an American company, you just get a much better valuation than if you're a European company. That's just yeah. uh, and not only for the exit, but also for follow on rounds, like, like for example, your B, uh, C round that you will be doing. Eh? Yeah, uh, you especially when you, get one of the, when you get one of the top guys in there, they do their magic and they bring in these guys that just follow the, the, the big guys and you just the valuations go up uh, quickly. That is true. They, can, they wave their magic wand or they... I was asking, can I have a little bit of the, the bottle with magic fluid to sprinkle over my companies? But, uh, Philip, Tesla, did they already uh, buy a couple of startups, to your knowledge, in the past? I'm, I'm not involved in the M&A, so um, I just what I know is that there is uh, that there's a couple of uh, um, small smaller companies along the value chain that Tesla has already purchased. Some of them just uh, quite recently, mm. and um, also Tesla has the known approach and target of um, having critical whatever we deem critical within the value chain, um, and that's a very broad perspective. Um, we want to control ourselves. Um, so I think there's the tendency in the future that uh, Tesla probably will have. Nothing, they don't necessarily have to be startups. They could be also smaller companies that are around for a long time but have a value in themselves that is specific, of specific interest for Tesla. And that's what Tesla is doing at the moment already. And since you joined Tesla, how much did you learn about the American <coughs> way of doing business? How different is it? What How much I did think you have I think it is, this is I think exactly it's like did you settle in okay what's the revenue yeah so it's really a different approach and uh, and what I really like and but that's also something that we did at Zon Battery as, as well back in the day um, is that you're really hands on so you're not thinking too long about you know what could be the perfect way you're like you know this is the direction we want to walk let's take something forward in there and the feedback from the market And from, very, from a big group of intelligent young guys, this will actually form the product itself. Yeah, so, um, and this is, I think, something Germans tend to uh, sit in the laboratory to figure out the perfect product for a market that is not even evolved yet. And that's a huge issue, yeah, because you'll never have the perfect product. Um, and you, you, you need to find something that you can sell once. Das and, uh, Land der yeah. Again? Das Land der Intellektuellen. Yeah, but I think, yeah, I, I, no, it's also, I think we are completely afraid of failure. Germans are afraid of failure, so they want to make it perfect, and they think that they learn, or we think that we learn how it's done. And once you've learned how it's done, you'll always do it right. But uh, whenever you evolve and innovate, you'll not have that luxury, so you'll just have to try and error. And I think um, this, is, this is what the Americans are really good at. Um, yeah and then just have a fast learning curve. Make a lot of mistakes and make them fast. I think this is yeah. good advice. Yeah. Christoph, you are traveling very often to the US. What did you learn so far? How is it different there? What can you share? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I, share ex uh, I share the experience. They look the same, but they're not the same, of course. But um, uh, uh, I think it was, it was wise to take the time to learn a little bit the system. It was very wise in terms of investors. I showed up with a, as, a, as a small Bavarian company with three and a half million revenues, and I told them, listen, I don't want money from you. I just want to explain you my business model, and I want, I want to be on your watch list, and this is it. And this uh, puts us actually in a, in a quite good position because um, from time to time I revisited them, and, uh, and um, they learned that what I promised was actually more or less, as usual, fulfilled. But um, uh, now uh, we are already at a very good, good position. Um, I learned also about business, but as Philip already mentioned, I think we have um, a, a pretty similar approach. We are, just, we are just doing things, and we are not so much um, German regarding our engineering approach. So our, this is also why we are in the fifth product generation, because we are simply doing it, and we are learning, and we are learning fast, and we are developing our product, we are developing our company, we are developing the team, this was pretty good. And I think it was also a good decision to work from the beginning with the locals and with advisors on the legal side, on the business side, in order to, to develop the business even without a product, from scratch and without time pressure. Yeah. And you have a channel partners, right? You announced a deal with a Sungevity. 
Why I did announce announce it? You announced it, no? You, I, I, so, yeah, yeah, I did, I did, absolutely. Just <laughs> it was just announced. Oh. No, yeah, no. <laughs> are you crazy? Don't Before the Powerball <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> press uh, meeting, you sent out the press release with the longevity deal. Oh yes, but it's coincidence. Just the day before, it was not uh, on purpose. <laughs> no, but yeah, this actually we this is one of uh, uh, the partnerships we are going for in the U.S. Longevity. It's a very important partnership for us, and there are other partnerships to be announced in the coming weeks. Yeah, and the Longevity deal it, it will be a white label Zon uh, battery, and they Absolutely. put their logo on. Yes, and they sell it, and they install it, and they monitor it, and Absolutely. everything. Absolutely, and they get a nice margin for it. But they had Hopefully, to pre-order. Yes. <laughs> did they have to have? Uh, did they make a pre-order from you? Well, our general um, uh, strategy from Europe, we will do it with small adaptations in the U.S. as well. First of all, we will um, build up our own installers network with Sun and Battery Centers. So this uh, gives us, let's say, the freedom to choose with whom we want to work because we are basically independent and we have basically a strong network via via which we can sell. And then we are going also for. Um, a white label strategy with a limited number of partners, a limited number of partners because otherwise it's ridiculous. Uh, sooner or later, partners are getting with the same product or um, uh, with small ad adaptations, they get into price competition, which makes from our point of view no sense. So we try to get the best in class partners also there. And exactly as in Europe, we are um, generally working only with firm, firm commitments. Because as we are only working with a limited number of partners, we want to choose the right partners. If we are wrong there, and if somebody is not seriously interested in working with us, it's probably the, the wrong partner. So this is um, a very important thing. Are you a pure equipment seller then in the US, or, uh, or do you have a business model that's aligned with their business model? I have, we have a business model that is aligned with their business model, absolutely. So more similar to what you do in Europe? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Just that we have... Um, uh, different use cases in the US. For example, in the commercial segment, the, the peak shaving issue due to the demand charges are not existing in Germany because we have different tariff structures, obviously. So this is a thing we had to develop from scratch, actually, the software, for example, for that, right? Yeah. Uk, um, what is your experience uh, up to now talking to American investors? Do they like your software made in France? Well, Do you think uh, you can get one or two of them? I'm certain we're going to get two or three of them. I have no question about that. But uh, no, I agree with what Bart said. I mean, it's, it's, it's a complicated market because uh, you really need to, uh, to uh, develop this um, understanding of the Americans that is not, they, and they are not similar to Europeans. Now, that being said... And, we and certainly not similar to French. And not similar to French. <laughs> now, that being said, we sent one of the co-founder of the company there yeah, so that he really men. gets really close to these people. Michel. Yeah. That's a very good idea. I forgot yeah. that one. That is actually it's a key element. Yes. Totally and agree. we wanted to show our commitment and we also wanted to learn because, you know, we learn a lot from this market and we can implement what, some of the learnings back in France to develop our products. So that was a very important point for us. Now, that being said, we are, uh, as I said, we are also looking, looking at uh, securing key mentors around the company. And some of them are really good in the U.S. if you, can, if you are lucky enough to get close to them. And, and they, you can learn a lot, again, from them. And they've got the right connections at the right level, and they can help you really um, adapting your strategy for the American market. So it's still very early for us, but we, that's what we are doing, getting the right people around the company so that we, we implement the right strategy for the U.S. market. Um, now, the other, the other thing we it's learned... It's a long process to enter, yeah? It takes well, one, two years to build up relationships, Yeah, to I guess one, one, two years to learn is a, is, is a good thing. Now, we, we started to set up partnership. We are working with uh, Autodesk on, on pilots. Uh, we are currently discussing with a few customers in the U.S. with whom we are planning to do our first joint application development specific for the U.S. market. And the third thing is that, as I mentioned this morning, we are working on key applications that are highly re replicable, scalable for the whole market. So we are also working on building the right distribution channel for the U.S. for these applications. Okay. 
I think we are approaching our first break, including beer and wine. For me, it's totally okay if you drink your first beer or glass of wine. If you promise, it will not be your last one. So let's wrap it up. I, I can promise that. Okay, <laughs> let's have a drink and close this panel. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>